So hello, today we're going to do some example problems for chapter nine. Uh, chapter nine is kind of an interesting one because it kind of has a few different sections of things. There is the whole Young's modulus information and shield modulus and bulk modulus equations that I could do stuff with. But on top of that, there's also everything we did with pressure. Pressure versus force, pressure as a function of depth, and also uh, Pascal principle. But on top of that also, there's buoyancy, which I have actually down here because of space. Um, and really all of these topics can show up. And so what I put on the exam, which, oh, quick comment. The next exam is the final exam. Normally by now I would have announced when the final exam is, but the school hasn't finalized the final exam schedule. So as soon as I know what it is, I will let you know. But um, on the final, there will be a question from chapter nine, but I could really go in any of these routes. They're kind of hard to mix together. Um, just to get ahead of it, um, problem on this packet, problem one is an old exam problem. Um, problem two is also an old exam problem, though a very old exam problem, like my second semester ever. Problem three is not, but problem four is an old exam problem. And I'm going to try to cover all of these topics I listed here today among these problems. And so I'm just going to jump right in with the first one, which was when I wrote this, the person who was the went the deepest in the ocean on their own was film director James Cameron. James Cameron took all the money he made on Titanic and decided to fund a mission to go to the bottom of the ocean. And the basis of his funding is he would give all the money for it as long as he was the one who got to do it. Um, yeah, I think this was Titanic money. I'm pretty sure this is pre-Avatar money. Um, so this, this might be out of date. It's been a few years old, but at the time, the deepest anyone's been in the ocean was James Cameron, who went to a depth of 10,908 meters in the Deep Sea Challenger. And so what we got, do, 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 do. is so the Deep Sea Challenger had a depth which is normally put as H for some reason, of 10,908 meters. And it says, if the pressure above the water is 101,325 pascals, which is air pressure at sea level, and the density of salt water is 1025 um, kilograms per meter cubed, what is the pressure at that depth. Well, this is pretty obviously pressure as a function of depth. Um, I mean, I'm looking for the pressure at some depth. Anytime you want to find pressure as a function of depth, the equation it goes by is that pressure equals pressure above the substance plus rho g h. Once again, keep track of your rows and your p's because they're going to be both in this equation. And what I can say is that the pressure at this depth will be the pressure above the water plus the density of water times G times the depth of water. And I just do this math. Any questions? Now, this was on the final. On the final, I will work in some unit conversions, and I actually did one explicitly here. And I said, convert this number to ATMs, where one ATM equals 101,325 Pascals. Um, I just kind of did this because it's kind of interesting. Um, ATMs is the pressure of the atmosphere. So this will just say how many times more it is than being out in the air. But this is just a simple unit conversion. Well, cancel out Pascals to get ATMs. Now, 
and you get its 1,083 times atmospheric pressure, which is pretty fucking huge. That is enough that can crush most things. It's why we've never really explored the bottom of the ocean, is that the pressure gets so big, it breaks things. Any questions so far? All right. Part C. If the same pressure was acting along the length of a steel bar that is 7.3 meters long, which is the depth, which is the length of Deep Sea Challenger. So if we have something that's 7.3 meters long and it's put under that pressure, how much shorter would the would the how much shorter would the bow how much shorter would the bow be? Now we're looking at a force pushing on something. We're looking at stress and strain. Now, if you note, I also say um, Young's modulus for oops, Young's modulus for steel is this value. If I ever tell you a value for Young's modulus, you're probably going to need the Young's modulus equation. Where the Young's modulus equation just simply states that stress, oh sorry, stress equals Young's modulus times strain. But I gave a pretty big hint here. See, I don't know a force. I don't know an area. I gave Young's modulus. I want delta L, I want L naught, but I didn't give this force or area. But I said, use the pressure from A as the stress on the ball. You see, pressure is force times area. And so I'm just going to say the pressure from A, that's going to be the stress. I can then multiply both sides by L naught. Divide both sides by Y. And you get that it's four millimeter shorter. Not much. Despite how huge that pressure is. Oh, my water's empty. Nothing in there at all. Okay. That's annoying. Any questions, though? Okay. Um, when I do pressure as a function of depth, I normally end up doing things underwater just because that's what we normally talk about it. I sometimes have to do other things like the molasses problem we did in class. It's one of the few exceptions. But here's another one with more Beatles references than you can normally fit in a problem. And it says, a certain brightly colored submarine carries a group of musicians deep underwater to an octopus's garden. The yellow submarine has windows with a diameter of 20 centimeters. I mean, if you look at the picture, in fact, I said a diameter. That means they're round windows. I wouldn't get a diameter otherwise. And if the diameter is 20 centimeters, that means they have a radius of 10 centimeters or 0.1 meter. The manufacturer says the windows can withstand forces of 1 times 10 to the 6 newtons. What is the submarine's maximum safe depth? Well, once again, we're looking at pressure as a function of depth. I didn't give a pressure, I gave a force, but I'm looking at how deep it can go. So this will still be P equals P naught plus rho G H. And I wanna find the maximum depth. But if I wanna find the maximum depth, I need to know what the maximum pressure is. And I don't know the pressure, I know the force. But keep in mind, pressure, by definition, is force over area. Now, these are round windows. So the area of these windows is just going to be pi r squared, because that's the area of a circle. And therefore, the maximum pressure will be the force over pi times 0.1 meter squared, which is 3.18 times 10 to the 7th pascals. 
not as deep as my uh, deep sea challenger from the last problem. I can now plug that in for P and solve for H. What I'll do is I'll subtract P naught from both sides. And then I'll divide both sides by rho G. There you go. As I said, this is an old exam problem, but a very old one. I probably wouldn't do. If I did one like this, I'd probably add a part A or B in somewhere. Uh, it would probably look more like that first problem. OK. Let's look at something else. This next problem is not one I wrote. This is blatantly stolen from a textbook. And it says, a bulbul can raise a customer's chair by applying a force of 150 newtons to a hydraulic piston with that area. The chair is attached to a piston of a new area. How massive a customer can the chair raise, AK, what is the maximum mass? Here's what I got. Uh, this problem is actually kind of a trick question, which I'll get back to in a second. But for now, I'll just say we got a piston. Um, that then goes to another side. And on this side, is a chair. I can draw a chair, really. And on this chair is some person. And we want to know what is the maximum mass this person can be. OK? Well, what I know is I know the area on this side. And I know the area on this side also. And I'm saying they are applying a force of 150 newtons. That's the force applied here. I can then find the force on the other side. Pascal principle says the pressure on both sides is the same. That F1 over A1 equals F2 over A2. And therefore, the maximum force this thing can lift, I can just multiply both sides by A2. And the maximum force it can lift will be F1 A2 over A1. That's the maximum force. Any more than that, and you're past what it can lift. Um, 150 newtons, A2 is 0.1 meters squared, and A1 is 0.01 meters squared, and so the value is just for multiplying by 10. Now, I didn't say what force can lift, I said what's the maximum mass it can lift. So that's the total weight it can lift. If you want to find the mass, if that's the weight it can lift, weight equals mg, the mass is just going to be that weight over g. Or 1500 newtons over 9.81 meters per second squared. So the maximum mass is 153 kilograms. Um, so when I first started teaching, I didn't originally use Vanco Hall for homework. I used the thing that came with the textbook. And I actually had this problem on the homework. And no one ever got it right. Because most people could get to this step. But this is kind of a trick question. Because this is the maximum mass it can lift. It can lift 153 kilograms. I didn't ask for the maximum mass it could lift. I asked for the mass, maximum mass of this person. You see, it also has to lift the chair. The chair weighs 5 kilograms. So the mass of the person is going to be the mass maximum it can lift minus the mass of the chair, which, as I said, is kind of a trick question. 
and I I still use it here because it doesn't really matter if you get them right or wrong for these practice problems, but it's kind of a dumb asshole thing to ask. And apparently I'm too lazy to write my own problem for this. Questions? A state right now, I always ask this question mostly for the people in the room who can see it, but since there's very few people in the room, I'm assuming the rest of this class is watching on, on YouTube. I know that's not the case because I can see the YouTube views. And I know most of you just aren't watching it, and that's why so many people are failing the class. But um, if you're one of the people watching the YouTube video and you have questions, you can, you can still ask them to me. Just shoot me emails. I'll answer them. I always help with, try to help with explanation here, even if you're watching the video. If you're not watching this, you didn't hear my little rant about why you're failing the class, so it didn't help anyone other than me venting. So that's fun. I'm in a mood today. Okay. Let's look at the last problem. The last problem is going to be buoyancy. Is going to be buoyancy. And most buoyancy problems, they're kind of interesting the way they work. Because a buoyancy is normally a force problem where you're just going to have multiple forces and one of them will be B and one of them will be W. And you never solve for B, you never solve for W. You have the B minus W term, which we have an equation for. Now, I really like this problem because normally it's just like, what fun things from pop culture can I work in? This one, I didn't do that. This one is a real life story that I think is batshit crazy. In, I forget what year, I had it written down somewhere, but once there was a man named Larry Walters. I want to say it was in the 80s, but I, well, don't quote me to that. Um, that Larry Walters went and got a uh, lawn chair and a shit ton of helium balloons. And he tied, he tied the chair to the ground, filled up all these weather balloons, attached them to the chair, hooked up an air tank just to make sure, and got a BB gun. And got on the chair and cut the ropes holding the chair down and took off and went flying. He literally just went flying around with no control over where he went because it was just balloons in a chair. Uh, he did have control of his height. He, the reason he brought a BB gun it was he would shoot the weather balloons when he wanted to go down, which would pop one balloon. And if it popped the balloon, it would decrease the buoyant force so he could start accelerating downwards. Um, the fun bit of this story is he had no control over where he went. And this is an actual picture of Larry in the bottom. Um, and he accidentally flew over um, LAX, the Los Angeles airport, which kind of shut down flights for a little bit because there was this flying person in the way of the planes. Um, they actually arrested him for violating the Federal um, Aviation Act which is flying in controlled airspace. And they also find him for flying without a pilot's license, which I think is a real great to add to that. But yeah, true story of a thing someone did. And it's kind of crazy. So let's just say it's one large balloon because that'll be simple. What volume of helium would be needed to lift Larry if Larry and his chair has a mass of 80 kilograms? That's the question. Now, this is definitely buoyancy. Things float because of buoyancy. And yes, that might be like wood floats in water because of buoyancy, but it's also why helium floats in air. So if I want to say due to buoyancy, he floats up, I'm going to need by start by saying that that buoyancy is a force. I'm just going to say good old F equals MA. And if I want to find the minimum vo volume to pull him upwards, I just want the minimum volume to hold him in spot. That minimum volume to hold him in spot is going to be when his acceleration is zero. Anything more than that, he'll accelerate up. Anything less than that, he'll accelerate down. But right when his acceleration is zero, that's when he'll just stay at a given height. So if I'm going to do this as a force problem, not too surprising, I'm going to start it the same way I start all other force problems with a free body diagram. Now, I know there are very few of you in the room, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, now, you, it's kind of curious where you're going to put the forces, because the obvious thing would seem to be put the forces on Larry, right? But that's not what we're going to do. 
See, I'm going to look at because buoyancy is working on Larry, but negligible. Buoyancy is acting on the helium balloons. That's really what's holding up. So instead, we're going to do what is the force on the balloons? And so for the people in the room, see if you guys will answer. What forces are acting on those balloons? Would air pressure be something? Air pressure isn't really a thing, but what air pressure causes is the buoyant force. So we'll use that instead. What else acts on the balloons? Um, the mass of Larry and the chair. The mass of Larry in the chair, which I'm just going to call MG. Really, I should probably put it as a tension because he's attached by a rope, but I'm just going to put it as MG since we know Larry's mass. Anything else? The last one is kind of not usually pe one that people think of. So I'll just do the last one. See, here's the idea. And I know I'm getting off camera for a second, but there's a reason because I want to get a balloon. I don't have any helium balloon, but I have a balloon. Which is like all wrapped up at the bottom, so I can't just inflate it. Okay. Now. If I look at this, and even when I try to make the setup Larry had, which is something pulling down, pretend it's a helium balloon instead. You like to think helium balloons because the helium go upwards. You know, you don't really think about more than that. But let's say I have a non-helium balloon like this. I let go, it falls. It falls because of gravity. You see, the balloon has mass. Helium also has mass. The other force, the one we're missing, is another force due to gravity, which will be the weight of the helium. Helium might float up in air, but it's still affected by helium. If Sorry, it's still affected by gravity. Helium has, you go chemistry, it has an helium has an atomic mass of four grams per mole. I'm shocked I have that memorized still. And so gravity does affect the helium. Gravity does pull it down. It's just counteracted by the buoyancy. And actually, that's part of the reason you can only float up so high is because as you go up, the pr air pressure goes down. That's a whole other can of worms. Um, or not air pressure, um, air density goes down. We're going to ignore that for now. And so there's my forces. The buoyancy is, brings it up, and it's pulled down by two things, the weight of the helium and the weight of Larry. This is exactly the same as the Baymax question we did Wednesday. Just that one was underwater. And so I'll look at my free body diagram and say, OK, sum of forces equals 0. I'm only looking in y. And in y, it's always up minus down, while up, I have b. Down. I have the weight of the balloons, and I have the weight of Larry. Now, I'm doing something kind of weird here. I'm using W for weight for the balloons and not for Larry. And I usually don't even use W for weight, right? I usually do MG. But the reason why is because I want to make sure that you recognize how much it looks like this equation. See, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to solve for B. I'm not going to solve for W. I'm going to solve for B minus W. That B minus W, this bit right here is rho fluid minus rho object GV. That is always what I can do. Now, you may say, but there's no fluid here. There's no real object here. That's because this is traditionally done for things in water. But when I say fluid, that's the surrounding stuff. So really, this should be rho of the air. That's the surrounding stuff. And the thing that's being affected on, that's the balloons. So rho of helium. Because helium is the object. Air is the fluid. Now I'm looking for volume, so I'm going to add Larry to both sides. I'll then divide both sides by G. If I divide both sides by G, they cancel out. And then I can divide both sides by the bit in parentheses.
and say it will be Larry's mass over the density of air, which is 1.23, 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed, minus the density of helium, 0 0.164. That's how much you needed, 75.4 meters cubed, which is a pretty decent sized volume. Um, four thirds uh, times three divided by four, four thirds pi divided by pi, oops, to the, if this was one perfectly spherical balloon, it would have a radius of 2.6 meters. So, it's big, but a 2.6 radius isn't massive. But yeah, it's a thing. This guy did, got arrested for it. Um, fun addition to this, this wasn't the last time he got arrested for such things. He got arrested the second time later on for doing something else with going flying in a non-conventional aircraft, though I do not remember the details. Um, it's been a while since I've read about Larry. Any questions here? Okay. Um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, your homework for this will be due next Wednesday. And the lab opened up yesterday. That's going to be on buoyancy. Next class, we will get into springs and pendulums. Have a good day.